The Sherman Players presents The Twelve Days of Christmas Carol, an audio production of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, starring Matt Austin, Dean Alexander, Jody Bayer, Noel Desiato, Michael Wright, and Desiree Kelly. Part 6, read by Dean Alexander. Scrooge has been given a glimpse of Bell's life without him and received the second spirit, the ghost of Christmas present. You've never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Uh, Never, Scrooge made answer to it. I've never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young. My elder brother's born in these later years, perused the phantom. I don't think I have, said Scrooge. I'm afraid I have not. Have you many brothers, spirit? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas present rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I I went forth last night on compulsion, and I I learned a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you have aught to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told, and held it fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkeys, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, puddings, fruit and punch, all vanished instantly. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning, where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music and scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings, and from the tops of their houses, whence it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plumping down in the road below, and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with the smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs, with the dirtiest snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of Carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times, where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were choked up with a a dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in a shower of sooty atoms as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had by one consent caught fire and were blazing away to their dear heart's content. There was nothing very cheerful in the climate or the town, and yet there was an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavored to diffuse in vain. For the people who were shoveling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets and now and then exchanging a facetious snowball, better-natured missile far than many a wordy jest, laughing heartily if it went right and not less heartily if it went wrong. (laughs) Uh, The poulterers' shops were still half open, and the fruiterers were radiant in their glory. There were great, round, pot-bellied baskets of chestnuts shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lolling at the doors and tumbling out into the street in their apoplectic opulence. There were ruddy, brown-faced, broad-girthed Spanish onions, shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars, and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by and glanced demurely at the hung-up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids, There were bunches of grapes made in the housekeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of filberts, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks amongst the woods and pleasant shufflings ankle-deep through withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squat and swarthy, setting off the yellow of the oranges and lemons 
and in the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth among these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant-blooded race, appeared to know that there was something going on and to a fish went gasping round and round their little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh, the grocers, <laughs> nearly closed with perhaps two shutters down or one. But through those gaps, such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descending on the counter made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scent of tea and coffee were so grateful to the nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, the other spices so delicious, the candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat and in its Christmas dress. But the customers were all so hurried and so eager in the hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly and left their purchases upon the counter, came running back to fetch them and committed hundreds of the like mistakes in the best humor possible, while the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons behind might have been their own, worn outside for general inspection, and for Christmas daws to peck at if they chose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes, with their gayest faces, and at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes, and nameless turnings innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker's shops. The sight of these poor revelers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in the baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as the bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch. And it was a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice, when there were angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, he shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humor was restored directly, for they said it was a shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was. <laughs> God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased, the bakers were shut up, and yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all these dinners and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven, where the pavement smoked as if the stones were cooking too. "'Is there a peculiar flavor in what you sprinkle from your torch?' asked Scrooge. "'There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day?' asked Scrooge. "'To any kindly given?' To a poor one most. Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge, after a moment's thought, I wonder you, of all the beings in many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining every seventh day often the only day on which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge. Wouldn't you? Aye, cried the spirit. You seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. I seek, exclaimed the spirit. Forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your name, or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some on this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their deeds of passion, pride, ill will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us and all our kith and kin as if they had never lived. Remember that, 
and charge their doings on themselves, not us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was a remarkable quality of the ghost, which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself to any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure of the good spirit had in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge's clerks. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his robe, and on the threshold of the door the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling with the sprinkling of his torch. <laughs> Think of that! Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Saturdays but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas present blessed his four-roomed house. Then up rose Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap and make a goodly show for sixpence, and she laid the cloth assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son and heir in honor of the day, into his mouth, rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own. And basking in the luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits danced about the table and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling up knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. "'What has ever gotten your precious father?' said Mrs. Cratchit. "'And your brother, Tiny Tim, and Martha, weren't as late last Christmas Day by half an hour.' "'Here's Martha, mother,' said a girl, appearing as she spoke. "'Here's Martha, mother,' cried the two young Cratchits. "'Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha!' "'Why, bless your heart alive, my dear, how late you are,' said Mrs. Cratchit, "'kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal.' We did a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind, so long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit. Sit ye down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm. Lord bless ye. No, no, there's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide! So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe hanging down before him and his threadbare clothes darned up and brushed to look seasonable, and Tiny Tim upon his shoulder. Ah, alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and had his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking round. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden declension in his high spirits, for he had been Tim's blood horse all the way from church, and had come home rampant. A coming upon Christmas Day? Martha didn't like to see him disappointed. If we're only in joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms while the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off to the wash house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little Tim behave? asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he, he gets thoughtful sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped that the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple, and it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was tremulous when he told them this, and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken. 
escorted by his brother and sister to a stool before the fire. And while Bob, turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons and stirred it round and round and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two ubiquitous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, with which they soon returned in high procession. Such a bustle ensued that you might have thought a goose the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him to a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly all along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it in the breast. But when she did, and when the long, expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of the knife and feebly cried, Hurrah! There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there ever was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. Eked out by applesauce and mashed potatoes, it was a sufficient dinner for the whole family. Indeed, as Mrs. Cratchit said with great delight, surveying one small atom of a bone upon the dish, they hadn't ate it all at last. Yet everyone had had enough, and the youngest Cratchits in particular were steeped in sage and onion to the eyebrows. But now, the plates being changed by Miss Belinda, Mrs. Cratchit left the room alone, too nervous to bear witness, to take the pudding up and bring it in. Suppose it should not be done enough. Uh, suppose it should break in turning out. Suppose somebody should have got over the wall of the backyard and stolen it. While they were all merry with the goose, a supposition at which the two young Cratchits became livid. All sorts of horrors were supposed. Hello, a great deal of steam. The pudding was out of the copper. A smell like a washing day, that was the cloth. A smell like an eating house and a pastry cook's next to each other with a laundress's next door to that. That was the pudding. In half a minute, Mrs. Cratchit entered flushed but smiling proudly with the pudding, like a speckled cannonball so hard and firm, blazing in half of half a quartern of ignited brandy, and bedight with Christmas holly stuck into the top. Oh, a wonderful pudding, Bob Cratchit said, and calmly too, that he regarded it as the greatest success achieved by Mrs. Cratchit since their marriage. Mrs. Cratchit said that now the weight was off her mind, she would confess she had her doubts about the quantity of the flour. Everybody had something to say about it, but nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family. Oh, would have been flat heresy to do so. Any Cratchit would have blushed to hint at such a thing. The Twelve Days of Christmas Carol is a Sherman Players production. Links by Barbara Bock. Recorded by Gary Blue and produced by Matt Austin and Steve Stott. If you enjoyed this production and would like to support us, please consider making a tax-deductible donation on our website, shermanplayers.org. Thank you.